So let me just say welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Renier. I'm the Prelights Community Manager. And today I will be chairing this festive webinar celebrating Prelights fifth birthday. Um, before we get started, just some practical information. We are recording this session uh, to make sure that we can make this publicly available later on. Uh, this is an hour long webinar which includes four short talks given by Prelights alumni who will share some of the challenges, opportunities and obstacles they faced during their careers so far. Um, the questions will follow after these talks and to get involved in a discussion, and I really encourage you to do so, uh, please use Zoom's Q&A function. I'll try to address as many of these questions as possible within the, the time that we have, and I do really look forward to this discussion part at the end. Um, so let's get started. For those of you joining who may not be too familiar with Prelights, uh, this is the name of the preprint highlighting service run by early career researchers and supported by the company of biologists. So the heart of Prelights really is this community of early career researchers who we know as the Prelighters, who select preprints that are of interest to them and the wider biological community. Prelighters write short posts highlighting their cho chosen preprint. And then they share these resulting prelight posts with the preprint authors, leading to a constructive discussion around the presented findings. They also share their prelight posts with their fellow prelighters. Um, and after this, they open up this discussion to all by publishing it, it on the prelights website. Since prelights was launched in February, February 2018, so over five years ago now, there have been several important milestones, including the introduction of conference and topic related prelists and being shortlisted for an innovation in publishing award. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, a group of prelighters, including one of the speakers today, started a COVID preprint highlighting service to curate COVID-19 preprints. A year later, prelights was fully integrated on BioArchive, allowing readers to navigate easily between BioArchive and prelights. Late last year, a new feature called Post Lights was introduced, which describes the journey of the preprint in becoming a peer reviewed published paper. And last month, during the birthday, we announced the Prelights Ambassador Scheme, which we hope will further expand Prelights' reach and help it grow further. All in all, though, Prelights has really grown up during the last five years, and this has only been possible because of the, pre the hard work of the Prelighters. And so today we're celebrating Prelights by celebrating the achievements of some of the prelighters. So with that, let me introduce the first speaker. We'll now hear from Martin, who has been part of the prelights community from the very beginning. When he joined, he was an EMBO postdoctoral fellow at the St. Free Laboratory at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And he'll tell us a bit more about his journey in becoming a PI at the University of Dundee. So Martin, I'll stop sharing and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me see whether I can share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you should all be able to see this. Um, yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, as Rainier said, I'm now a PI at the University of Dundee, and I'm going to give you a very personal, subjective view on, on my academic career. So obviously it's not a a recipe for everyone, but I think hopefully I can give you some pointers what, what I found important during this time. Um, the first slide, however, is a reminder that um, going for a tenure track of faculty position is not by all means the default when you do a PhD. Um, it sometimes feels like that, but just uh, this slide here to remind you, I think these are data from 2012 from the US, and here they say it's about 15% of um, of postdocs that end up in, in tenure track positions or tenure positions. Uh, I think nowadays it might be even lower. Um, so just to keep in mind, there's a lot of other valuable careers that you can do after a PhD and after a postdoc. Nevertheless, um, I decided to go for an academic, a classic academic career. Um, so I'll talk you through, through my stages, so to speak. I did my PhD at the University of Cologne in Germany. Um, for four years working on light signaling in, in plants. And I also did a, well, not super short postdoc. It was actually two years of postdoc afterwards to get um, a, a, my last paper published and to actually apply for fellowships. 
I was then successful to win an EMBO fellowship to join the group of Phil Wick in, uh, in Cambridge uh, to work on light and temperature signal integration in plants. And I stayed in Cambridge at the Sainsbury Laboratory for a total of six years. Obviously, that was a bit extended because of COVID. Um, I also switched groups in between, so I also worked a bit on phytohormone dynamics in, in plant development. And then during the last two years or so of that time, I was actively applying for jobs. And uh, something that is quite specific to the UK is you can apply for these independent fellowships that give you an independent position for um, usually five years. There are different types of fellowships. So I was successful in winning a Royal Society University Research Fellowship that allowed me to join the um, University of Dundee. As a group leader, um, I was first an independent investigator, which again is kind of specific to, to uh, some universities, I would say. It's like a pre-PI position, but I then relatively quickly progressed to uh, a full PI position. So I'm now on a tenure track and I'm a lecturer um, here in Dundee, working on transcriptional and post-transcriptional mechanisms in plant temperature responses. So you will see that there's also kind of a... Um, yeah, a red thread going through the topics I've been working on and I've been kind of narrowing down my, my niche as a researcher. Um, I decided to focus pretty much on what I find was important for, for finding a tenure track or a faculty position. And here are just a few pointers what, what people I think are looking at. Uh, one of the most important bits is the strategic fit for the to the department or the division. So how well do you complement the research that is present at the institution you're applying to? Um, it's obviously something you don't have really uh, much influence over, but nevertheless, it is really important for, um, for the panel uh, and what the panel is looking for. Then, of course, they're going to check whether you are a competitive person. So they will look at your publications and your funding. Um, again, the more or the higher quality publications, the better. However, I never had a CNS paper, so I've never published in Cell Nature or Science and still got the position. So these publications do help, but they are not essential, I would say. Again, funding is good to have. If you have a postdoc fellowship, it's great. If you had a PhD scholarship, uh, that all counts. But even travel grants, something like that, I would say, uh, is, is regarded positively. Um, then I have teaching in here, which has a little asterisk, because that can move up or down the list depending on where you're applying. You can apply at like uh, teaching-focused positions, which then teaching experience is really, really important. You can apply to research institutions where teaching is not important at all. And the only thing you really do is maybe supervise a master student. And then obviously it moves down the list. Um, what is also looked at is recognition. And I mean, that can be something formal like awards, but it can be also more the general, how well are you known in your in your community? Um, do you go to conferences? Have you been maybe invited to, to seminars at other universities or in other groups? Um, that is a plus on your, uh, your side for sure. And then um, I'm skipping the next point and just saying, I have put transferable and technical skills at the bottom because they're kind of assumed as a given at this point. Whereas when, when you're hiring a postdoc, skills are really, really important, right? You want to have a person with a specific skill, skill set that can do a certain task. Here, it's just assumed that you have the basic skill sets that are necessary for your job. Um, and then the last point I have here is synergistic activities. That is kind of an umbrella term for a lot of things that can be academic duties that you do, like doing peer review, uh, committee work, um, Organizing meetings, for example, um, outreach is a really, really important point here. So um, engaging with the uh, with the general public um, and I think science communication and also uh, getting involved with the publishing industry falls into that. And I think this is where pre lights slides in nicely. Um, so I've been a pre lighter for two years and a bit. Um, I have done in total 11 preprint highlights. And at the end of my pre-lights career, I also joined uh, another journal, Plant Physiology, as an assistant features editor, did that for two years, um, wrote in total six news and views. And I mean, I chose that essentially because I do like writing, but I didn't only do it out of the good of my heart or because it's fun. I mean, it is, but um, there's also advantages that come with it. You do improve your writing skills. So you will get a lot of feedback on your writing. Um, you gain insight into the uh, editorial process. Um, 
in case of pre-lights is how uh, does the preprint go to finally to be a, a full journal article. Plant physiology, we actually see the, the process from the inside. Um, you do get connected to your peers, to the authors in case of pre-lights and to editors, and these connections can be really valuable. And you also gain visibility in your community because people will see that you authored these pre-lights, right? So, so there's a lot of positives that come with it. And the final slide I want to show uh, is the key points I think that you can do to yeah, enhance your career and make it make yourself more competitive when you go for these positions. So what can you do to, to become more competitive? The most important thing is your research, right? So you need to do excellent research and to publish excellent research. Without that, it won't work. Um, while you're doing that, try to develop your research brand, as I called it here. So try to find your niche that you will be known at in the future. That's something people will be looking for. Um, do apply for funding, do apply for fellowships, for travel grants, whatever, it all counts. Network is really, really important. Um, these people will write reference letters. These people will review your grants and your applications. These people provide support for you. Um, so do network in any way possible. Teaching, as I said, be, be picky about that and decide, is it really important for what you want to do in the future or not? And do as much as is appropriate. Pick some academic duties and activities. Don't do too much because, as I said, research is the most important bit. Pick some things that you think you will enjoy and then uh, they, they should help your career. Try to round out your skill set during your postdoc. And also really important uh, is try to keep a work and non-work balance. I don't like the work-life wording because your work is part of life, right? But try to keep a balance that works for you because it needs to be sustainable. And lastly, who can help with that? Well, your supervisor is really important and hopefully you will have a supervisor during your postdoc who is really dedicated to help you in your career. You may also want to get a mentor, which doesn't have to be a supervisor. That can be another person that you can bounce ideas off or just, you know, vent to and, and give you advice. Your colleagues and peers will be invaluable because they support you when things are not going well. The same is true for your family and friends. And obviously there's also training courses and professional development that you can uh, yeah, make use of in the, uh, if you need to. And that's me done. And I'm happy to pass on to the next speaker. Great. Thank you, Martin. That was very good. Uh, just a reminder, so indeed the questions will be at the end. Please do post your thoughts, questions in the Q&A section. Um, next up, we have Sejil, uh, yeah, who joined. I need to stop sharing one Sorry. moment. Yes. There we go. Or not. I don't want to change it. I just want to stop. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Great. All right. So we have, so I can also share my slides, but I let me not do that. So next up we have Sejal who joined Prelights in 2019 as a postdoc working at the Advanced Science Research Center at the City University of New York. She is now an assistant science editor at The Scientist and will tell us how she ended up there. Uh, so uh, take it away, Sejal. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, hi everyone, and uh, thank you, Rainier, for this opportunity. And I'm I'm really excited to be here as a, as a former pre-lighter. Um, so, just a brief introduction about me, as you can see here. Um, I I am a neuroscientist by training. I I have a, a data science background, and uh, I'm an avid science writer and like professionally an editor. So, these are some of the professional titles I have, and, and I assume a lot of people here uh, would be considering their career moves. Um, so before I jump into my own trajectory, you know, I, I just put it out here for everyone that, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, where you end up in, in the next five years. I think your training, what you're doing right now, it does provide you a lot of transferable skills. So for in, in my case, um, I wanted to be in academia, that, that is what I wanted to do. I love doing research, but I was also uh, very realistic about it as you know, um, Matthew mentioned that, you know, there are not as many tenure track positions. So when I was building my career and when I was in my PhD, I think there are a couple of things that uh, 
I sort of worked on and, you know, sort of uh, tried to sell them as a transferable skill that could help me in developing a non-academic career. So I break them down here, you know, research is something that's for everyone. I, I highlighted a bunch of those that, that, that keep coming back a lot, you know, how well you can analyze data, how good your statistics are, you know, how good you are in critical thinking or problem solving, you know, that, that all of you are pretty much, you know, doing a great job on a day-to-day -day basis. The other thing that I sort of uh, started doing is like, you know, just honing my communication skills. Uh, and uh, it's something that I like, but I knew that I, I don't have the skills. And even to be a PI, it's something that you have to be good at. So I started working on it like very early on, you know, writing blog posts or, uh, you know, editing my friend's uh, thesis or their papers, you know, doing more of, um, you know, um, public speaking that is tailored to different audiences. And uh, the other thing that I was very interested in is, you know, I wanted to be part of policy making or some sort of advocacy that also involved in, you know, how to talk to different type of people, you know, how to do a different type of writing. So these are some of the things that came in very handy when I started thinking about my non-academic career. And well, with that, let me just like briefly show you the, the, the trajectory that I had. Um, so I grew up in India. Um, I come from Western part of India. I did my bachelor's and master's degree in, in, in my hometown. Then I, I got very lucky to find a research position uh, a, at National Center, at Biological Center, some of you might be familiar with. Um, and that's where I did my pre-doctoral studies and that's what sort of kick-started my, my research career. One thing I want to highlight here that until I did, I went to the university, I did not speak English. Uh, I learned English as an adult. And uh, through my research experience, it helped me to, to come to uh, Montreal uh, at McGill University for my PhD in neuroscience. And this is where I, I really, you know, started thinking about my career because we had a lot of resources and, and uh, you know, a lot of talks that what are you going to do after your PhD? And Around that time, you know, some of my friends were pre-lighters and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. This, this, this looks like a good fit and, and a lot of uh, good learning opportunities. So towards the end of my PhD, I actually ended up joining the pre-lights community. And, uh, and I think it sort of helped me learn a lot about, you know, not just how to write, but mostly, you know, how to understand how to find good science. And I sort of continued doing it until my, my postdoc in, in New York. And around that time, you know, COVID, all the other reason, I decided to not pursue the academic career. And uh, I applied to be an assistant science editor at the, the Scientist magazine. And to be honest, if it wasn't for the, the pre-light uh, um, you know, experience, I wouldn't have been able to get that position because if you are trying to get into that direction, be a professional writer and editor, you would need a portfolio and your writing sample. And at that point, I had so many that you know it, it sort of, I was able to convince somebody that yes, I am a serious writer and a communicator and, and I can do this. Um, so I did that for almost two years, as you can see here that uh, just two weeks ago, I, I was an a, a assistant editor and um, I no longer work with the scientists, but I'm currently working as a freelance science writer and uh, working with uh, a bunch of agencies and um, 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 as, uh, biotechs and startups uh, because different people have different writing needs. And over, the, over my editor tenure, what I realized is that um, I really learned the, the art, you know, how to sell something that is for the lay audience, how to write papers or white papers or, you know, like something that is very data centric for, um, let's say, a scientific audience. Let's say you want to buy a new instrument or you want to buy a new software that helps you do your RNA-seq analysis in, within minutes. So, you know, how to convince scientists 
or how to convince PIs or how to convince the university staff. So I think it, you know, writing can go in different ways and I'll be very happy to, you know, go deeper into those aspects in, in the Q&A. Um, then coming back to the transferable skills, I think along with writing, because I work with scientists, you know, startups, a lot of different kind of people, it also gave me a really good um, um, a training in how to just like see data and how to tell, you know, different people. And it's something that PhDs typically, you know, by default have that. Um, so I'd be very happy to answer that as well. Thank you. All right, that was great. Thank you very much, Sejul. Um, so we now move on to the person who actually published the very first Prelight post. Uh, Amanda. Funny enough, her first pre-light post was actually already on the website before it was actually officially launched. Um, so Amanda at the time was a postdoc at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and she will tell us how she moved on to the to her current academic position at the University of North Dakota in the, in the United States. So Amanda, the floor is yours. Great. You guys can see the screen for things? Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I didn't take my timeline back as early as some other people, but I can touch on those pieces as well. Um, like was said, I did um, have the reigning title of the first pre-light on the website, which was January 30th, um, 2018. Um, so essentially taking that back, I um, did, I defended my PhD in July of 2014. Um, and then I moved three days later um, to Canada. Um, I'm originally from Iowa in the United States. So I did my PhD at Iowa State University. Um, and then I started in August of 2014, my, PhD, my postdoc at the University of British Columbia. Um, and just kind of thinking through a lot of the stuff Martin said with thinking about your career and that kind of funnel of things going forward. Um, that transition to postdoc, I really liked what he said about um, it being about your transferable, like your technical skills. So that was one thing I really wanted to um, pick up in my postdoc. Um, I had previously just worked on cancer cell um, culture, and so I wanted to move into a model organism. Um, so I actually started my postdoc in a lab that was a Drosophila-based lab and kind of found when I kind of went there that they had a mouse project. They were starting into mice. So I started a mouse lab in a fly lab in my postdoc from kind of scratch at that point. Um, and that comes into later um, because I actually, even though I started my postdoc in 2014, my first postdoc paper didn't actually come out of the lab until 2018 with that kind of startup um, lag with the mouse work for those kind of things. Um, but Going back a little bit further, my journey in academia has been one of like, I knew what I wanted to do, and then it got really muddy for a while, and then I kind of settled on what I wanted to do. Because um, I'm a first generation college student, um, so the kind of whole world of higher education was um, really not there, like I didn't realize it was like career options and things like that. So I was actually going through my undergraduate degree to teach the K through 12 science system, because I always really like teaching. Um, and it was suggested to me by my education professors at the time, essentially all the way into my last year that like, hey, I don't think you're going to like high school science. Like I got really into like building PowerPoints and lesson plans that were like pushing the boundaries of what's like high school level. And they're like, I think you'd be happier like going to that next step. And I hadn't even thought about it. Um, so I applied to grad school. And then I really, really enjoyed grad school and essentially with the mindset that I would go back and teach at the higher level. So unlike Martin's position, where he's probably a majority research based, I'm a majority teaching based faculty at this point where 60% of my job is teaching. And so that's what I was aimed at at the beginning, but I loved research as soon as I got into it. So my um, PhD and then through my postdoc too, I'm like, I really enjoy the community, the scientific community, the sense of discovery and things like that. So I spent a while in my postdoc, I think, doing what a lot of everyone else said, which is developing these skills that are kind of, I knew they would be helpful later. I just wasn't exactly sure which tract they would fit into necessarily. Um, and I wanted to kind of explore my options. So I will join pre-lights for that exact same region is to build my writing skills, build my visibility. I was interested in the culture of science and like where publishing was going. 
At the same time, I was also writing blog posts for the American Society of Cell Biology, their trainee organization for COMPASS. Um, and then I had also joined, um, the other thing I wanna shout out is Future PI Slack. Um, so that is a peer mentoring Slack group. Um, that's their Twitter handle on the slide. Um, that is for people, it's more biomedical focused, um, but it's kind of becoming more broad. Um, people that are looking at faculty careers to help navigate that process. So I essentially had all of that kind of going on at the same time, which is why the beginning arrow is gray, because I wasn't really sure as I was going through. But early 2018, the same time that I joined Prelights, I had submitted at least my first, first author postdoc paper. And so that was going. Um, and then looking at all of the stuff and talking to my fellow community members, um, it really helped me just kind of figure out what I wanted to do and what I at least wanted to try at that point. Um, so I think that's one of the things that these initiatives, Prelights or other trainee focused um, groups, societies, that kind of stuff really does. It just gets you to talk to people, um, gets you the visibility to other people doing different jobs, but also that kind of networking across your current stage. So out of prelates at the time too, we also were able to write like a node blog post in response to some of um, publications that were a little bit more anti preprints, things like that. Um, and I really like the writing aspect, but come May, 2018, I decided I'm gonna try for one year on the academic job market. I'm gonna give it one go and we're gonna see how it goes. Um, because essentially my, I'd have to switch jobs in Canada because I was on an immigration visa. I'm like, we'll try it. And then if we're not, if it doesn't work, I'm gonna go back and look at like science editing jobs at that point, because I'd kind of given myself that base. Um, so the way at least the faculty job market in the States works is it's a whole year long process. So I kind of decided in May and then applications essentially start in like July and they peak in fall in October. Um, and through that time, I had stayed on Future PI Slack, and there's a lot of internal tracking and dialogue that goes on of like the jobs that are available, um, field specific, and like who's heard from different places, who's been invited different places for different opportunities. Um, so, and then building that brand, I'm going to blatantly self promote at this point. We started this faculty job collaboration um, through Future PI Slack. Um, so that's where the faculty job market survey idea was born, is that we were tracking all this stuff internally to that group. And then we decided to make it data and research and survey applicants after that cycle, the 2018 to 2019 cycle. Um, so I had started that project kind of independent of my research and getting into some more social science based research, which actually I think really helped my um, interviews and positions later on as I was looking for teaching focused things um, because they want you to balance that. They want you to have the research training, but then they're like, well, your future is gonna be dependent on improving your classes and those kind of educational research pieces. So it really helped me start getting that experience. Um, so yeah, December um, 2018 and then January 2019, I was doing interviews. Um, I interviewed at the University of North Dakota, um, which was a job that actually surprised me quite a bit that how much I liked it. So it's a little bit different. Um, if you're familiar with the types of institutions in the States, we have like R1, R2, R3, which essentially is based on the size of the research output of those universities. So R1 are research intensive. R3s essentially don't have PhD students. It's only like undergraduate teaching and undergraduate research. And then R2s exist in this weird space in between, which is where I found myself, is this weird space in between because I had grown really to love this research. So I love the balance between the amount that I teach and the undergraduate teaching I do while still having access to PhD students. So that's one thing I would probably um, pro put out there is if you're like really considering teaching versus research components, think about the type of institution because that balance is really variable across a whole bunch of different institutions. Um, and so I found a really nice fit at this R2. I accepted my job in March and I started my job in May, real fast turnaround. And then we launched that faculty job market survey. So if you haven't seen it, I put the name of the preprint that we posted in October, 2019. Since it's gone through the peer review process, it has a pre-light as well, um, written by somebody else, um, but it is published in eLife now 
And so a lot of the stuff Martin was talking about, some of those quantitative pieces, like how many publications do you need? And does it need to be a CNS paper? And do you need funding? We actually have quantitative data for. So if you're thinking that academic track, that would, um, again, blatantly self-promoting, I think it's a pretty good paper for that kind of stuff. And it's work we're continuing to do alongside like my smaller research um, output for things. But, and then since starting my faculty job, I've been able to design my own classes. So I teach a large enrollment anatomy and physiology classes. They're completely designed by me from scratch. I love that layer of independence. And like I said, I just really like the balance that I have between teaching and research. Great. Thank you very much, Amanda. That was great. Um, so again, keep those questions coming in the Q&A. Uh, last but certainly not least, we have Sagar, who joins us from Cambridge. Uh, when he joined Prelice in 2021, he was a postdoc at the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute, uh, but has since moved to a senior scientist position at higher stakes, where he helps establish systems that will enable the generation of lab-grown, antibiotic-free, cruelty-free meat. So please tell us more, Sagar. Look forward to this. Oh, can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Uh, thank you, Renia, uh, for that uh, lovely introduction and for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think a lot of what I'm going to say is going to overlap some uh, what with everything that uh, the uh, three previous speakers have said. Uh, but my uh, Journey started off well with a bachelor's and a master's in biotechnology. Uh, now, just to give a brief idea of why this part was relevant was because before I started my uh, bachelor's, I was actually thinking of doing an undergrad in food science because food has always been kind of central to me. I somehow always gravitated back to it, and uh, it was all uh, it was an exciting avenue, but there weren't enough opportunities available back in India at that point of time. And also, uh, similar to what Amanda said, I was the first person from my uh, entire family to go to uni. So there was nobody to actually guide me around, tell me how I could actually uh, go about. Uh, the, the more or less linear track after my master's, as convinced by my uh, tutors and uh, the professors in the department, was to do a PhD. Uh, I went on to do a PhD in cancer biology, where I worked on transcription mechanisms governing ovarian cancer metastasis. Uh, however, even through this point, my interest in food never kind of went down. And I was, I, I found myself while taking, undertaking all the research that I was doing during my PhD, uh, writing blog posts, reviews, and things like that, focusing a lot on food. Uh, and I think during my undergrad and my master's, there wasn't a lot of formal writing training uh, or communication training that I received, which suddenly when you start your PhD is quite scary because suddenly you have to write all of these pieces, which are quite formal. And uh, I had no idea of how I could best articulate my ideas. Uh, it was a long PhD. And I think it was towards the end of uh, 2019 or the mid of 2019 when I actually def defended my PhD uh, and went on to do a postdoctoral work in the Indian Institute of Sciences, where I started to work on the cell geometry of migrating cells. And it was during this point where I was introduced to the idea of preprints, because uh, one of our collaborators was a big advocate of uh, preprints. And I remember him trying to convince my PhD supervisor, as I was finishing my PhD, to upload my work to the bioarchive uh, server. And because it hadn't become a common stay in India, it was... Uh, it took a few months of convincing as to why that piece of research needed to go out there as we were going through rejection after rejection of our paper as we went through journals. So it, uh, and this was a piece of work that had been uh, sitting around for quite a few years. Uh, after finishing, this was a brief postdoc that I did in, uh, uh, in the Indian Institute of Sciences. And uh, again, as the linear track dictates, I was uh, interested to continue in research. And it was more or less assumed that I would go more towards the PI positions. However, it was the I was not able to find the right balance as to how can I focus on my research while not trying to uh, spend a lot of time uh, worrying about, say, funding opportunities or actually wondering whether my mentor was going to support my career or not. Um, but still went on, uh, started a postdoc in the Stem Cell Institute at uh, Cambridge. 
And where I started working on lung regeneration and for the first time got my hands on a model system, it was during this point where one of my lab mates was actually working, uh, was actually one of a pre, uh, was a pre lighter. And she introduced me to pre lights and she was just like, she enjoyed writing and she knew I enjoyed communication in general. I was still writing all those blog posts and reviews for food. And she was like, well, it, it might take a while for your paper to come out, but you can still enjoy writing uh, about science on a daily basis. So that's when I start, uh, applied for the call. I think it was in uh, 2021 that I uh, actually applied for the call and then started writing, uh, writing a few posts. Of course, gravitated more towards cancer and stem cells. Uh, but, uh, oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then while I was writing these posts, I was more or less sure again, because the linear trajectory had more or less been planned for me as opposed to being of my interest. And I found myself constantly coming back to food. And I was, I always would question, it would be so cool if I could marry my interest in cell biology with something in uh, food. And as the field of cultivated meat start kept on growing, I was just like, yes, this is a create our time to actually get into it. I have gained a lot of lab-based experience, of course, to uh, work in the field. And I think uh, the opportunity to ha of having talked about food for most of my adult life, and then also um, communicating science in a way whereby I could, uh, so uh, the, the PhD and the two postdocs, along with writing my papers, and then finally coming to pre-lights, had allowed me to simplify a lot of ideas for the layperson where I could try and communicate a, a piece of work to someone who's not from the field at all. So I think that allowed me to uh, pitch why I was kind of a really good fit for uh, the stem cell scientist position at higher stakes and uh, ended up landing there uh, where I've been for the last about nine months now. Uh, it was uh, even throughout this journey, I think the most exciting part, yes, uh, the P getting the PhD and then the postdocs was something that I had been trained to do almost since my undergrad. But the most exciting bit was applying for this job because I think mo throughout academia, I had never been given the idea that I had any transferable skills, which you start to question. You're like, oh, I can just work in the lab. I can actually write a a piece of work the way you want me to write it, but understanding how it can actually translate into the industry was very exciting. And as I started working, uh, actually applying for these jobs and had my interviews, at every stage I had to interact with people who were not stem cell scientists and still try to convince them why I had the skill set and all uh, the experience for that. So I think uh, having worked on so many different facets, uh, which were mostly associated with academia, but kind of always coming back to food, I ended up kind of landing up in the place where I did not think like a job that I did not think existed about a decade ago. And now it's like more of a dream come true where I think it's also been very exciting, very challenging at the same time. So uh, where I still get to do a lot of research on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is also being surrounded by people who are so excited about food and who are always ready to talk about it. And then also communicating the work that we're doing in the lab to a lot of people who are not essentially familiar with stem cells. Or when I actually try to explain pluripotency to a bunch of people who've never heard the word in their entire life before. And also try to convince uh, in people that, oh, when you eat our product in the future, it is not going to give you cancer. We are actually trying to make an edible product. So I think from that perspective, um, communication and actually the interest in the field of cells and food actually is has resulted in this almost linear, non-linear journey. Uh, definitely didn't think I was going to end up being a stem cell scientist in the cultivated meat sector, but it has been so exciting and yeah, very happy to have landed out here. Thanks. Stop that was sharing. great. Wonderful story. Well. Thank you to all panelists, of course. Uh, so now it is time for questions. Uh, there's two questions that I will start with from the uh, from the people attending. Uh, the first, let's just start with Martin, as he was the first speaker. Thanks. Uh, this is a question from Girish. From Girish, thanks for the talk, Martin. 
how how did you end up contributing as the feature editor? Were you invited or did you apply? How generally available are such positions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it was a call that was put out by the journal, by Plant Physiology at the time. Um, <clears throat> and I think they're doing that now regularly once a year. So they have a two-year turnover rate um, and they have like uh, different groups, job, some joining one year, some stopping the next. Um, I think the plant cell also do it. Um, but me being a plant scientist, I don't know how widespread it is outside of the plant sciences. Um, but it's definitely something that that the journals are looking at. And uh, as far as I can tell from plant physiology, their program is really successful. So hopefully other journals are following suit with that. Great. Um, I hope that answers the question. Then I, I will move uh, to Sergio. Uh, this is a question from Ilaria. Thanks for the talk. How did you transition into freelance writing? Any suggestions on how to find opportunities for freelance consulting in SciComs? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, the first part, like freelance writing, to be honest, anyone who wants to do it now, like, you know, you're writing for Prelights, you know, which is a volunteering service, but if you want to make some money, you can actually do it now. Um, all that you have to do is keep an eye on your social media, go on LinkedIn, go on Twitter. These are the two platforms that I used. And, uh, you know, you might have to like do a little bit of trial and error, work for different clients and, and then, you know, sort of go from there. Uh, once you start doing it, you will find a steady client where, or, you know, one or two steady clients where you just have like projects coming in. Um, so, so start with social media and let's say if you don't see anything, uh, write to magazines, you know, there are so many different science magazines, uh, you know, like, for, for example, there's like a spectrum that are like, you know, society, like news and view kind of magazines, write to them, write to biotech companies, write to pharma companies, you know, they will have, uh, you know, um, uh, some or other kind of, you know, document writing and say, okay. I'm a PhD. Uh, the good news is you already have, if you have your like pre-lights byline or like, you know, on the website, if you post a link, then you can say, okay, these are my writing samples. One tip uh, that I would give if anyone wants to go in that direction, I think pre-lights, uh, like a, we, we write a sort of in a, in a you know, our own style. Uh, so go on websites of different magazines and check for different formats. Uh, write a blog post that is a different style than what you're writing for pre-light. So have one or two samples that are in a different format so that you can showcase because you don't know what the freelancer wants out of you. And I think one of the most common one that you want to check is ghost writing. Like what does that entail for different companies? Um, so that's for the freelance writing. And for the communicate, like consulting in science communication, um, I think once you become like a writer and editor, and like if you have like a steady uh, like a job or a contract you also provide strategic advice that's what that job comes with so once you start doing that you can start saying hey look this company came to me and they say i want to create a white paper they had no idea i provided all the strategic and research information and that's how that's essentially consulting so once you start doing that put that as your transferable skill and then try to go find clients just the same way you have done for your writing. Great. All right. Well, keep those questions coming. Uh, this is a question from Helen. It's also something that I, I noticed indeed. Uh, so you were all talking about mentorship. I think I'm going uh, to ask this specifically to uh, Sagar and Amanda, um, as it was also maybe most relevant there. I was just wondering, and Helen also, whether you have any recommendations for finding a mentor and what characteristics we, we, we should look for. And I would also like to add um, how important mentoring other people is to you. Uh, so let's maybe start uh, with Amanda. Sure. Um, I'm actually gonna start with your second question of like how <laughs> mentoring is um, for me, like for my career. So when I went on like the job market, that was one of the things I did highlight is like how many like undergrads I had um, mentored in the lab. So during my postdoc, and I'll actually tie this to your first question. My postdoc mentor allowed me to be a sole advisor for undergraduate thesis. And that was a huge piece because that shows like your level of independence for things. 
Um, so that was really nice going forward. I had done a little bit in my, P like towards the end of my PhD, but that's an area that definitely kind of, if you can find the right opportunities explodes once you're in your postdoc is to be able to mentor um, like undergraduate scientists. And so I think that's one of the things when you're looking for your own mentor, um, um, particularly at the postdoc level is the uh, like variability in the uh, independence that they're going to let you have. Um, Cause particularly if you're looking at academic track, right? You're going towards that independence. Um, so that was something I specifically asked questions about. Um, another big one was um, the ability like to travel for conferences and stuff. That was one thing I really enjoyed about my postdoc. And that was, I know was a particular point of pride for my postdoc mentor was like, I wanna send people places so they can build their own network and stuff from that. So thinking, just thinking about like what what's their view on like what your journey is gonna be for this. Great, Sagar, do, would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah, I think just to build upon Amanda's uh, bit, I think for, for your second question, just to answer that bit first as well, yes. I think uh, mentoring uh, uh, other individuals has been really, it's actually been, uh, what's the word? Okay, I've forgotten the word anyways. Uh, it's it's uh, it's very rewarding in, in some ways because uh, during my PhD and my postdoc, uh, less so during my postdoc because of the uh, COVID pandemic, we did not get a lot of uh, interns coming in. But most, a lot during my PhD, uh, towards the end, of, end, I was able to mentor a lot of masters uh, interns who would come in, and uh, it was actually good to see that they were thinking of other opportunities at the end of the research experience, because uh, it previously it had uh, a lot of people who I had worked with until that point had only impressed that that's the only way that the only track that you can take but when I was finishing off my PhD I could see that a lot of them had actually gone on to do different career paths as well uh, with respect to mentorship uh, for me I think uh, I observed that uh, both of my mentors during my academic career were not uh, not my supervisors uh, and because unfortunately for me, I uh, was working with supervisors who were really keen on promoting their careers as opposed to mine. And uh, they kept on impressing upon the fact that the only way I could be successful was if I got, as Martin suggested, a CNS paper, uh, which wasn't helpful. But both of the other two mentors that I had were actually giving me options of what I could do with the skills that I had actually gained. They were the ones who were pointing me in different directions and they would always keep on informing me of opportunities other than those in academia. Even if, even they don't, even though they knew that I had uh, core interest in research, they would keep on informing me of how uh, I could use my skills for uh, non-academic purposes as well. And uh, I also remember them pointing me in the direction of, again, I think it was me being a naive PhD student, but uh, them pointing me in the direction of labs, which did not necessarily go the CNS route, but were turning out uh, academics and non-academics who were more full-fledged. So I think uh, that definitely was, uh, that is definitely a highlight when finding a mentor because if everyone is either becoming a PI or if they're, if they're not on the alumni list, then that is not very helpful uh, or a very healthy uh, output. But a lot of the people who gave me advice on, oh, these are alternate careers that you can go on have definitely stayed as mentors most of my career. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I have another question from Helen. I'm just going to pass it back to Martin. Um, did you find it difficult to balance your side projects such as prelites with your research as a postdoc? I'm um, just going to maybe ask multiple of you this question, uh, but Martin, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, sometimes it, it can be the case that you're really busy in the lab, but you also have something you really want to write about and then it, uh, it gets busy. Um, so I think one thing I really paid attention to is that I pick activities like writing for pre-lights where I feel I don't need to spend tons of time on to to put out like a decent uh, piece of writing. Um, other people have asked me, oh, do you think writing for pre-lights is something I should do? And I think it's a good idea to do it 
if you if you like this kind of stuff, right? But if it's only improving your writing style, but you actually hate the process of writing, maybe that's not exactly what you want to do. So um, yeah, be picky what you what what you do in these kind of synergistic activities. I would say. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I, ha I have something to add to yes. that. Yes, um, go for it, please. I, it was something that was on my mind from the first day that I applied for pre lights and I set a boundary that, you know, if I'm going to pick one, I'm going to give myself a good four weeks to finish that and uh, not overwhelm myself with multiple pre lights or go look for the preprints, you know, because we all have to do that. Um, so make sure you said that, like, I think numbers doesn't matter. That's a beauty with pre-light community. You know, if you write one every three months, that's okay. And that's exactly what I did. That gave me enough time to just do a good job in writing and, you know, like, you know, enjoy the process. But at the same time, not, you know, have other things uh, get in the way, way of, uh, you know, my, my uh, volunteering commitments. Great. Great addition. Um, yeah. Amanda, would you like to say something about uh, this? Or I'll be quick. I have... Yes, go for it. I was going to say, I always found it really helpful to stay up on the literature, which was an activity I was already doing. So just as an example, from that very first pre-light, there's a figure in there that made it into my research application, like my research statement in my faculty applications. Um, so pairing up, write about stuff you're already reading. Yeah. It's like, all right. <laughs> No, I definitely was just agree, vigorously agreeing with Amanda because that's how I went about selecting my preprints as well, pre lights. It was very helpful. Great. All right, then there's actually a specific question for Amanda. Uh, so it's about your eLife paper. Um, this person was wondering if there were any results from your job survey that surprised you. I think the biggest surprise that came out of it, um, I think given the discourse around what it takes to get a faculty job market, is the fact that we don't know what it takes to get a faculty job. Um, the way, since I've continued doing that work, I've really come to thinking about it as there are thresholds you have to get to that make you competitive in the process, that get you to the point of like a phone or a Zoom interview. Past that point, we cannot like quantitatively at this point differentiate people um, and who gets a job and who doesn't. Like that strategic fit piece I don't think anyone's done a great job of um, describing what it means. And sometimes it's like really dependent on the institution. So kind of thinking about what I was talking about, we uh, now I'm search, like serving on search committees. We have to um, fill very specific teaching needs. We don't have the bandwidth to just hire like good people where R1 sometimes that's the advice is like apply to every position if you like this institution because they can probably take you. And that's really institution dependent on how much leeway people have with that yeah. too. Yeah. So I think get yourself into a competitive position and then it's a whole lot of fit luck based right. past that. My own follow-up question on this would also be, so this eLife paper of yours was published in 2020. I'm also wondering, do these things constantly change, right? These things, uh, that are, these requirements basically. Yeah, so that's what we've been starting to track. So we have put out the survey um, every year since then. So we're starting to look at some longitudinal data we kind of took a pause to specifically look at COVID impacts. And so we paired with the Higher, Higher Education Research Consortium, the HERC job postings. Um, so we looked at job postings and they dropped for 2020, um, but the job market did pop back up. So we have another preprint on that too. So the job, we're kind of looking at pairing like what those thresholds are and then comparing that to the availability of jobs over time to get at some of that competitiveness metric. So I think we'll see sh small shifts, right? So like everyone starts, who works in this area, starts with the like, in the 1970s, you didn't even need a paper. And then we have the data from now. So we're looking at like gradual changes between how that happened. And I'm sure we'll just see it go up, but. Right. Yeah, 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 I would imagine so. Uh, so Gar, I have a question again, that might be, that relates to, all of you, but I'll, Sagar, I'll start with you. So uh, you've all moved countries to pursue your career ambitions. I was just wondering whether you could elaborate on the challenges of this, of moving internationally. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely was a challenge not made, not made easier by the pandemic because I moved in December 2019 and uh, I think I was just getting to the grips with uh, 
getting my inductions done for the building when the building started to shut down and uh, uh, working in a lab which was mostly focused on mice and unfortunately we had to cull all the mice that were there in the facility because we could not keep them alive while the techs were away that significantly hindered every single aspect of the projects that were going on at that point uh i did uh, i think the challenge was uh i think the the bit of apart from the cultural impact it was also the isolation because uh, moving to a new country and then before you can actually start networking you are then put into quarantine so it was about six to eight, eight months of seeing nobody but my supervisor and two or three members of the lab which proved to be quite stressful at that point of time because we were all tired uh but i think with time uh we uh i think well once we start once things started opening up it was a lot easier to integrate and then also to uh i, I started participating in um any and all uh, online uh, forums that we could, that the institute was offering, whether it was interacting with the new incoming PhD students or it was just the weekly mental health check checkup. And I think that helped quite a lot. Uh, once, uh, I think it was towards the mid or end of 2021 where there was some sense of normalcy. And uh, that I think from that point onwards, it was a lot easier having now finally i think it, my social or and professional network has just developed in the last one year because of that great lack period that i had but since then yeah i think it's been a lot easier and uh, even also understanding different perspectives because uh, i both my phd and my initial postdoc were in india whereas when i moved over here i suddenly had was exposed to this great diversity so even that made a huge impact yeah yeah i mean I don't know whether other people want to comment on this, but we have little time. And I thought maybe one final question to all, as I'm just going to go uh, to everyone again. I think it would be what's your, the best piece of advice you would give someone who is eager to pursue a similar career. So, Martin, maybe let's start with you on this question. Uh, one piece of advice. It's, uh, it's tricky, but um, yeah. Well, tr try to enjoy what you do, I think, because if you don't enjoy your job, it's it's better to look for something else, right? If you if you notice, oh, I'm writing is so much more fun for me than doing research, maybe find a career in writing. So really pick something that you're passionate about and that you like doing. That That is one important piece of advice, I would say. Yes, it is, for sure. Uh, Sergio, would you, would you like to? Yeah, I'll say open your horizons, you know. Um... Uh, we all love to do our, you know, specific project in the lab, but I think writing or like consulting or like any data positions, I think you have to be aware of different research areas and how things are done there. Uh, and Prila, I think to be honest, like personally, I do like that. I always love to read uh, what's happening in other research area. And I sort of channeled that into the pre like post that I was, uh, uh, you know, sharing. So, you know, try to incorporate uh, that a little bit as a habit, you know, if you are trying to go into the non-academic career, it does come in handy. Yeah, yeah, great piece of advice. Um, Amanda, would you like to say something here? Yeah, I think um, bouncing off of those kind of pieces too, like align, align your time with your priorities the best that you can. Um, even as a professor now, I have to keep in mind my percentages of like teaching, research and service, like in really, make sure that's what I'm actually spending my time on is what is actually on my contract. It's a little bit harder as you're coming up into the training world because sometimes, um, as was mentioned by a couple of people, your career aspirations don't exactly match your supervisors. Um, so you got to make some compromises there, but just keep that always in mind of like, there's a point to me putting my time into these activities if they're really what you think is going to carry you forward. Yeah, great point. And lastly, Sagar. Um, yeah, I think it's just going to be a mashup of everybody's, but uh, definitely uh, maintain a certain level of flexibility and what you can go ahead and do it uh, in your career, because that plays a huge role in trying to look for more opportunities and uh, fo follow your passions. Yeah, if if as Martin said, if it's not fun anymore, definitely staying there is uh, and doing that piece of work isn't that much fun. Uh, and in the end, find a good mentor that makes and breaks a lot of things. So yes. Great. A good note to, to end on. I think we're just in time. 
unless there's any final takeaway messages from the panelists, I just really like to thank them for their time. Also, thank you to the audience for uh, well, asking questions and for being here. There will be future events, uh, similar type of events, so you'll hear more about these in the future. Uh, but for now, thank you all very much and hope to see you soon at another such event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.